All right, how's it, John Lewis, it, in the house? Yeah. You are just a uh, Renaissance Island boy, born and raised, right? Born and raised in Hawaii. Okay, and should I call you the granddaddy of uh, MMA world? I don't know about that, but I know I was there in the beginning, been fighting for a long time, been training great fighters for a long time. Now, to give a 411 for the folks that uh, does not know the other side of you, you also dabble in creating music, actually have a CD released, you've done performance arts, you of course excel in the MMA world, and now you're into clubs and event promotion. Did I miss anything? <laughs> You got it right. I mean, I mean, I do a lot of different things. You know, I'm recording another album right now. Um, uh, but mainly right now, my livelihood is training my students, my school here in Las Vegas, and also um, my club entertainment industry, which I have a company called John Lewis Entertainment Group that basically books all the special events for all the clubs here in Chicago, New York, LA, Miami, um, Atlantic City. It's pretty much pretty busy. So when do you find time to sleep? Uh, I don't sleep. I sleep when I'm dead. <laughs> Alright, your first fight was back in 1995, man, before it was called MMA, I think, and how's the scene different now? I mean, just blown up completely. Yeah, it's actually not my first fight, but it's my first fight on record, it was like, you know, the actual show, when, and that was in Hawaii, actually, you know, I fought for a while before that, too, but um, that show was really good, I mean, it's blown up a lot, you know, that was in, uh, I think that was the Thomas, no, not Thomas and Mac, what's that, the arena, the arena in, in Hawaii? Oh, NBC, yeah, New Blaisdell, Blaisdell yeah. I still call that, oh, yeah. Good fights, man, it was, a, it was a good time, a lot of, a lot of fans were there. Um, it was my first taste of like a lot of people, I think 7,000, 8,000 people at the time, which is a lot back then. Yeah. It was a pretty neat experience. And uh, since then, the sport's grown incredibly. Yeah. Well, Hawaii is like Scrap City, USA at the right? beginning, man. It's you, you, you were born fighting over there, man. That's how you make your name, right? Yeah, Yo, definitely. You have a school there, too. Or you train or you, uh, you taught over there, too, right? I had a school there for a few years. Um, it was the same school as this. It's my partner's school over there. And um, I had a couple of my students. Mark Wynn was my student at the time over there and some other guys. And they were... Um, and he was a purple belt over there at my school. I trained, I, he taught at that school, I had some other guys I had as well. But after a couple of years, the problem I had is that people wanted to train with me and I had both schools, so I had to go back like every other week almost. For a couple of years, it got kind of hard to do that. Um, so it, I figured I had to put my energy in, into one place more, give my uh, loyalty to one place more, or else everybody's gonna be unhappy, you know? You know, back in those days, the big thing was like Kung Fu and Karate. How'd you pick up Jiu Jitsu in Hawaii? You know, I, I've been doing martial arts since I was a little kid. I'm 38 years old now, so I've been training martial arts for over 25 years, and um, and just fighting, like you say, growing up fighting in the streets yeah. of Hawaii. I'm also, um, you know, my first art was this Japanese kickboxing system. That was my first art off of the concept of street fighting. I was already a good street fighter. I was always like a lot of guys in Hawaii. Can throw like scrap, like, like beef. Scrap. You know, a lot of guys can do this. Okay? I like one cheeseburger. No. But I wanted to go to the next step, you know. Right. So I met a guy. I met a guy who was a really, really good coach of a Japanese system. He had called Shokondo, which is basically Thai boxing, but it's in Japan, Japan you know. So um, that was my first arc that really made me see a discipline to the fighting besides just being tough, you know. Yeah. And uh, from then on, I just grew. I mean, I got black belts and I have two black belts in that. I have a uh, judo black belt. I have Japanese wow. judo black belt. I have four black belts, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I mean, I've been training for a long time. You know, I just basically want to be well rounded, and uh, that was my whole concept is trying to learn as much as I can, and I ended up being who I am today. Wow, amazing. That's a lot of, lot of hours in the gym, yeah. a lot of practice outside, I guess, uh, to, test the, to test to see if it works. <laughs> In the beginning, but that's part of what I started fighting for. When I started fighting, was not so much that. I mean, I was a, I was an adult, you know. I wasn't a punk kid anymore. Oh, and, yeah. you know, and I never was the, the bully, anyways. I was always the one defending against the bullies, you know. And um, or at least using that for my excuse. You know? <laughs> oh, so, yeah. So um, basically, that somebody came to me who was just starting the, um, the shows, the fighting shows, and said, "Listen, you know, you're a great fighter. You know, you have a lot you can do." His name is John Peretti. He was the matchmaker for the first UFC. And he goes, um, but you know, you, I have a sweat form right now for you to try to see what you really do against other world-class fighters. And that was extreme fighting. So I did some other fights first, the Hawaii fights and so on, but extreme fighting was my first TV fight with the Gracie. And that was, my, and that was why I kind of got into it, really, just to really see if everything I put through all those years, all my fighting, put on a, on a level against somebody who wasn't just some street kid, but someone who actually skills, who would, who would uh, hold up. And it did, you know, it did. Amazing. You can be considered the grandfather of mixed martial arts in Hawaii. Mm, that's cool. Right? There's a lot of great kids coming in Hawaii right now in the MMA world. It's yeah. just caught it by the storm. And uh, in fact, the last tough show on Spike TV actually outdrew a Major League Baseball playoff game. That's how big it is. Attracting more men in the 18 to 34 age group than any other show that night on TV, man. Wow, that's crazy. Man. Yeah, what do you think was the turning point for MMA? I think when the Fertitas bought the UFC was the turning point. Because we, we went out for a little while and then Senator McCain kind of stopped to that. Uh, oh, yeah. took it off TV and so on and, and it became a real problem. Uh, the fans kept it alive by by staying loyal through the internet and just keeping their their, their uh, hope alive. But when the Petitas came in, they had the money to play the game on a big level, and they would put millions and millions and millions of dollars into the industry to make to bring it back, you know, and to get it back on TV and everything like that. And now it's paying off. They're making the money again, and uh, 
But uh, thanks to them, I think it was, you know, um, I brought them into the sport, actually. I actually trained those guys for a couple of years, Dana White, uh, Lorenzo, and Frank Petita, for about two years, and they, they really began, began to love this, uh, the art and understand the art as for a sport that it really is. They got excited and said, ah, I can put us by the UFC and did it, and uh, the rest is history, you know. Yeah, I think it's like the, one of the most competitive sport there is out there in terms of a uh, personal competitiveness, you know, I think golf is great mentally and da da da, tennis, so on and so forth, but I mean there's no other thing that uh, does does you like MMA and training and competing, is there? No, there's not, you know, um, this sport is so strange, uh, so vast with so many different elements into it, it's one of the one sports that maybe for the most part you can think who's going to win the fights, but you can always be wrong, you know, I mean, you can always be wrong in this sport, it's very interesting, so I think it's, um, it's going to keep itself interesting for that reason. What do you think holds in the future for um, MMA? There's so many, so many championships, so many different organizations. Uh, I think uh, the future, you know, it's just going to get bigger and bigger. There's going to be you no know, prize now in Las Vegas. It's going to be here next week. Um, that's going to be very successful. Um, a few other shows are trying to get out there and make it happen. The ones that are going to step, the ones that have the money to step it up, are going to be there'll be a two, three good players in the sport, um, and there'll be a lot of little smaller ones, but a lot of big players in the sport. That I think eventually you know, be the same thing as in boxing where you have a few big organizations, you know, and I think it'll get to that point eventually and hopefully what will happen is they'll start becoming unified titles and we'll, they'll be, right now it's kind of in a situation where everybody's trying to make their own money in their own little world, but when the sport really grows it's going to be where, where is the, you know, the WBA title and the so-and-so title and the so-and-so title and the undisputed champion and it becomes more of an overall game that has more legitimacy in that manner. Right. And uh, you are a coach and a trainer to some of the biggest names in the MMA world, such as uh, your good buddy Chuck Liddell, Tito Ortiz, Randy Couture, Matt Linden, Marvin Eastman is going to fight soon. How do you get to become a trainer uh, from uh, becoming from a fighter? I mean, training in MMA. You know, I've always, I've always um, been a very strategic fighter. My style has always been based on strategy. My teaching in my school is always based on strategy. I don't have a format in my mind that you have to learn or any of the rules that I have to follow of how to teach someone. So I've always been good at um, taking someone's talent and building on their talent as opposed to telling them what they've been doing is wrong and this is how they have to do it. So I don't like the cookie, the cookie you know, mold thing where you make everybody the exact same. So uh, I've earned the respect of a lot of great fighters for my strategic um, concepts. Um, sometimes I'm involved in people's fights just from a strategic level, helping them design really? how to beat the guy. Other times it's teaching them the ground fighting. I've been Chuck's coach from his first fight on, which has been about 10, 11 years now. And um, I like to try to train Randy Couture, and Corner Vernell, and Lennon, I mean, Maurice Smith, all of them. And it's really because just because uh, they respect my uh, strategy and my mind to help develop them in the tool they already have. So you're taking that no rules to the next level, kind of, within the, the confines of MMA. Just whatever works for the fighter, that's what you tell them to excel in, basically. Right. If I get a great uh, stand-up fighter, a great kickboxer, or a, great, or a boxer, um, I'm not going to just try to make them give up on boxing. just want to become a jiu-jitsu guy. You know, I'm going to help them learn how to not be taken down and how to be able to get up off the ground when he's on his back. That's what I do with Chuck. Chuck oh, Kuman. yeah. Chuck Kuman is a great great uh, stand-up fighter and he could wrestle but what I did with Chuck in the very beginning is I focused all of our attention on getting up from your back from the half guard and, and things like that using certain positions that would help him be able to get back to his feet and he's probably the best in the business at that now oh yes um, and that's his game that's what he does you know I don't I don't send a class and make him put a gi on and make him learn how to do you know his jiu-jitsu learn his jiu-jitsu I basically just train him in what he's good at and basically it's that same thing with a wrestler if I get a good ground fighting guy the wrestler, I'm not gonna. I'll, I'll teach him how to um, use his hands to defend first, you know, keep, keep, so he can stay in the game of boxing. But how to use his hands to get inside and take the guy down, and then win on the ground with submission, not to stay in the guard, but find out how to finish the fight. So basically, I formulate the strategy and this, and, they, and build on the guy's talents that he already has to make him greater. Who are some of the rising uh, stock in your stable in terms of fighters that is up and coming that nobody's heard yet? You no, know, we have Dan Evanson. He's a heavyweight. He's a very, very tough guy. Really, um, he's. About 280 pounds of fitness, um, great hands, great legs, uh, grapple is great. I mean, he's going to be real strong maybe here by him in the future. Um, Marvin Eastman been going back and forth, but he's uh, tougher than he's ever been right now. You know, a lot of the times right now, um, a lot of the guys in the school here are um, just trying to develop themselves as fighters. I'm not the kind of guy that you want to come If you want to, to come to someone's school and just, like, be here for two weeks and he gets you a fight, it's not going to happen. You know what I mean? That's not, that's not me. I'm not, I'm not the right guy for you. I'm the guy that if you really want to make a career out of it and don't want to ruin your uh, your your record in the first you know six months then you got to be patient here with me you got to learn you got to learn to get to, to learn whatever you need to do to go in there safely and uh, you're going to get good you know so I mean anybody who's given me that respect and trust to, to get them to a certain level have always been successful I've never let anybody down 
it's always the ones that are can't wait any longer that run off to try to fight with another team that end up losing and winning and losing and winning and it's fun and all that, and they get, but they're never going to make a career out of it. What do you look for in terms of potential when a person coming in wanting to be a hopeful, you know, I in the sky, I'm going to be the next MMA dude or whatever? What do you look for in them? First of all, I look for heart, the most important thing, you know, I put them in there with the guys who train hard, you know, we just see where their head is, you know, if they have that, that tenacity to just to go, to go, to go, even when they're tired. Second of all, I try to see if they have something specific I can build on. Um, you have to have, like I said, you have to have one element. You have to either be good on your feet, you have to either be good in, in wrestling, or you have to either be good in submission. You have to have something to build on. Um, if you don't have anything to build on and you're young enough, no problem, you're gonna be, you, have, you have a way to go. You have a long, a long road ahead of you before you're ready to be, be fighting. But if you at least come to the school uh, with one of those elements that I have something to build on, uh, I can work with you and definitely you gotta have the heart. Yeah, and uh, one of your students actually has oh, is a very good instructor. Uh, it, we're talking about Mark Lehman of Cobra Kai. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, you gave him the black belt. Is that correct? Yeah, I gave him his, purple, his brown and his black belt. And black, okay. What do you? How do you think he would have done in terms of MMA? MMA in, well, in terms of fighting. He's not a fighter, you know. Uh, he doesn't claim to be a fighter. He's a, you know, he's he's always been a, a grappling expert, and he's a very good grappling expert. He's very very good. He was a good student. Um, you know, he's obviously good. Um, I don't think that he has it in his heart to be a fighter, and everybody doesn't have it in their heart to be a fighter. So I can't hold that against him, you know, but I don't consider him a fighter. All right. There's a forever debate about this, boxing versus MMA. What do you think? Oh, two good guys fighting. There's no question. There's not even a debate, actually. How could you possibly even compare the two when it comes to um, the sport of MMA? If you, put, if you put it in a street situation, it's way easier to take somebody down than it is to make them stand up. So if, I mean, even a high school wrestler can be a good boxer if he's a good wrestler just because he can get you on the floor and then you don't have any boxing anymore. But with all that said, if you try to put an MMA fighter in the ring as a professional boxer and they have to box and follow boxing rules, probably the MMA fighter is going to get knocked out. So it's just, it is what it is, you know. Right. Um, in terms of cardio and training, isn't there like way more to uh, MMA than sweet science and, and what they say, you know? There's so many things you have to uh, hone your skills on when you're training. Yeah, you always get better. I mean, you know, you, you're you going to see fighters like, even like Matt Hughes, guys like that who are incredibly, incredibly good. They've been fighting for a long amount of time, um, you know, wrestling their whole life. They're still better every fight because there's so much to learn. There's so much to get better at. There's always something that you can improve within your game as a whole. So this is a sport that is totally all about um, evolution and development. Um, it's always going to be the kids that are 17 and 18 years old that are going to be the future, you know what I mean, no matter how good we are now. Yep. Um, and, and it'll go on and on and on that way because the sport doesn't really have rules, meaning you can do any style of fighting you want. It's, as creative as the world gets with different arts and different things to bring into the picture, those things are going to consistently be um, merged into our art of mixed martial arts. So I see it's going to be a never-ending growth of uh, incredible fighters. Yeah. Next forever debate. Talent level in Pride and UFC, the two biggest league in the, the mixed martial arts world. They're about to collide, I think, both coming in Vegas. Yeah, I think that uh, yeah, the light heavyweight um, and under division is controlled by the UFC. Uh, there are a couple of good, good fighters in Pride that way as well, but the heavyweights is controlled by Pride. That's my oh yeah, Fedor, he is yeah, a nuts. Few, not only that, I mean, he's a, 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 there's a lot of great heavyweights in Pride. You're right. And uh, uh, what is a fight that you would like to see between a Pride or UFC fighter? If that um, could happen, of course, with all the contract legality and blah, blah, blah. Right. Well, of course, Vandalay and Chuck's always been something to talk about. Um, Although recently with Vandalay's loss, it takes a little, bit of, up, yeah. off, a little bit of the excitement out of that match. Um, that's still one that you know Chuck's always wanted to do. He's always been game for that fight. Um, probably Vandalay wanted to too. Just like you said, it's just it's more politics than anything else. Um, besides that, everybody I, I want to see fight are the guys that are like the you know 185s to one to uh, 205s. Those those guys some good matches in there. You know Dan Henderson. I'm a big fan of Dan Henderson. He's a great fighter. I'd love to see him in the 185s. In the UFC, like he used to be in the old days, he's incredible. It's hard to beat. Um, so, I mean, some of those matches would be interesting to me. Those, those, that, those divisions, 185, 205. Oh yeah. How do you think uh, Pride's gonna do in the next couple of weeks? It's gonna be great. I think it's gonna be huge. I mean, it's, it's the first uh, Pride in the United States, so everybody's watching on TV. Everybody knows how good of a show it is. It's for anything other than the fact that it's just they get a chance to see it in real life for the first time. It's gonna be hugely successful, I believe. Well, great. Um, actually. Uh, one thing I like about Pride is is like, that fight with Vandy and Krokop, you know, where the, even though they're in different weight class, it's just the best man win, you know, and that's 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 quite amazing, you know. Yeah. I wish UFC could do something like that, then you can really once and for all say who's the best. 
I know it's true. It's true. But you know, um, my opinion, you know, you know, in the old days, jujitsu was all about it doesn't matter how big you are or the weight. You know, it's about technique. That's, that's not true these days. I mean, the, these days, if you have a, an equal, an equally skilled big heavyweight guy and an equally skilled, you know, Walter weight or middleweight guy, the heavyweight guy is going to be able to beat him because this. It comes down to the weight and the power at that point. Technique's good on both sides. The sports evolved too far to use that terminology anymore. Now, that was because in the old days, maybe you have a, a 175 or 185 pound great grappler, submission guy, and, and nobody knows the sport very well. And then you get a you know, 230 pound big brute who can just punch really good, and the little guy's technique can beat this big guy. But now the same big guy these days knows the same technique as this little guy. It's not the same anymore, you know. So I think that it's, one time it's exciting, you know, to see the big guy fight the little guy. But another way, um, it is getting dangerous that, that, that these days for that because the weight's such a factor now when the technique's equal. Um, well, that that is true. But that crow cup anti fight was fabulous. My it goodness, was fabulous. it was fabulous for the fans. No oh yes, definitely. Now, you, that's the other side of you. Finish with the MMA stuff from MMA to club promo. How did you get started in that? Uh, when I started WFA, my fighting show, the World Fighting Alliance, um, I. Uh, called in a partner of mine who I, I didn't know at the time but his name was John Huntington who was the uh, they call him the king of clubs he had the, the hugest he still does have the biggest touring uh, nightclub in the country you know, 10,000 people at one event and I knew that I wanted to get the best guy to help me do this I had the concept which was where the fight club meets the nightclub and basically it was putting those two elements together well bringing this gentleman in John Huntington um, to help me bring the nightclub atmosphere to what I specialize in which is the fight club atmosphere excuse me we were able to um, merge and make this really great new um, synergetic syner um, synergy for this, this show well when that show started finishing um, I, he was con still continuing on with his club promotions and things like that and he said hey John you know you know, why don't you come work with me for some of the, the club stuff that we do so we went over to the, it was the ghost bar in the Palms and I kind of went in there and started doing um, helping him with promotions doing guest lists doing things like that kind of just Work. Now, this was going to be for fun, for some extra money per week, and um, it ended up being something I was really, really good at, you know, and then over time I ended up taking over that whole event myself, and I ended up doing the, all the special events for the Palms for a couple of years, and the last two years I've been over at um, Pure Management Group, which is all the Pure Clubs, the four or five clubs they run, um, but recently I resigned, I resigned from there, because now my company, John Lewis Entertainment Group, has grown to a, a level where I can book for all the clubs here, and I book all over the United States as well. I'm not in just one location; I'm, I'm everywhere now. So, kind of just—it it wasn't my original plan to get into this industry. I just really excelled at it real fast, and you can make a lot of money in this industry. I mean, from the east to the west, they know John Lewis Promotions, man. Miami, New York, over here. I mean, they—they—they they, they know your your party's good, man. What makes a successful event? Uh, well, first of all, it's not just um, a, a, you know a guestless kind of thing. It's more like putting together events. I mean, celebrity hosted events, you know, fashion based events, just different specific events that, that their purpose is to make people want to come to the club that night. So I'm able to book that in anywhere in the United States or in the country for that matter because it's pretty much that format will work at any venue. So I work at the best venues and then my company also has a publicist, a PR firm, it has a bunch of other divisions to it that we put all that into the energy into each venue that we work for that one specific one off. So basically it's just like you'll see my name in on you know in all the different states, you know, I'll be in Miami this weekend and Chicago next weekend, and like I said, after that. So I'm just constantly working at the same time, making sure I have time to take care of my boys here. How crazy is the scene now in, in the club scene as compared to the 80s and 90s? Uh, I mean, it was crazier probably back then. You know? <laughs> I mean, it's, it, the, the money is different nowadays. Oh, it's yes. huge now. It's um, unbelievable. It's, uh, the, 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 event, the, the venues are beautiful. There's a lot of money put into the venues. But, uh, you know, everything's a lot more controlled now. You know, I mean, I wasn't I wasn't in a big club in those old days. I was in the fighting days at that point. But, you know, the old days of Studio 54 and all that, it was drugs and sex and, yeah. you know, it was oh, yeah. crazy. And, but now there's a lot more, you know, control. Table service yeah, and rolled, rolled, bottle yeah, service yeah. or whatever. I think it's not as crazy now as it used to be in those days, but it's definitely uh, a lot a lot of fun. And it's, uh, you know, it's a fun, fun environment to be in for a job. You know, now, you yeah. Destination spots now the clubs are exactly. not not the place to hang out no more. A yeah. destination spot to be right. seen. People come to, to come to Vegas to get a chance to go to these some of these clubs. Yeah, how is Vegas so uh, so unique compared to other places? I mean, we're holding up to the rest of the world as, as the enter entertainment capital of the world. I think we're holding up to. It. I think we're leading it. You know, I think uh, Las Vegas clubs are ahead of any other club. We have some great clubs in um, a few a few good ones in uh, New York. Um, we have some in Miami. But nobody puts the money into the to the nights and the clubs that Vegas puts into it because Vegas has a gambling market and they have that market to, to support it, you know. 
a club. It's not. It's not unreasonable, unrealistic to see a club put twelve million dollars or fourteen million dollars into their opening to build their club out here. That's no just the opening night. You mean? No, just just building. Oh, building it. it. Oh, wow, fourteen. That's wow. nothing. That's, that's no. If you don't put that into it, you don't have a competing club. That's Las Vegas, you know. I'll, you, my my event that I book can be anywhere from three thousand dollars for a night to forty thousand dollars for a night for one event. Meaning the club paid that much money to have that event there. They wouldn't pay thirty thousand dollars for a host if they didn't think it wasn't going to bring back some benefit. Whether it be marketing, whether it be uh, you know people coming into the club is going to spend a lot of money. I mean, you can't compare. I mean, a great a great bar in another place in New York might be. Thirty thousand dollars for a night, where a great bar in Las Vegas is about one hundred and seventy thousand dollars in one night. Yeah, we hear places like uh, just uh, I think yesterday CBGB, which is the legendary punk rock place, just went out of business or will be closing soon. And uh, last year, my understanding is Las Vegas took over uh, New York City as the city with the most four-star restaurants. I mean, this is the perfect place for 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 what you do. I mean, for both MMA and club it's promotion. Great base for for both. I mean, now if you know all the. The UFC is here. I mean, the owners live. Pride is going to be here. I'm pretty sure. The fight capital of the world has always been boxing. The vice boxing yes. capital. Now it's the UFC. Now it's the Ultimate Fighting or the Mixed Martial Arts capital. And club wise and entertainment wise, you can't be Vegas. Vegas got everything you possibly want. I mean, everything that's good anywhere else in the world, a hotel puts it in their club, in their hotel. So what's next on your plate? I'm afraid to ask. Well, like I said, I'm recording my album right now. Um, you'll be hearing about that soon. It's a rock and roll album. Um, it's got a little ways to go on it still, but that's the next thing you're going to hear. My, when you mentioned it earlier. That was like maybe 15 years ago. Like, exactly. I just not known, but since then, I've been very seriously back into the music industry again, and um, I'll be you'll be hearing from me soon on that level as well. Wow, John Lewis, thank you very much for your time. Next time I meet with you again, I, I don't know what you'll be. You could be like a politician, maybe. You never know. Hey, you got the guys from Hawaii, man. Want to come down and train? You know, I take care of you guys. You know, 15 percent off for anybody from Hawaii. You know, just just keep it in the family. Well, big up to John Lewis. Thank you very much for your time.